He's been called slimy and evil, the biggest villain of all time, and the prissy, cold Germanic elitist. Who is this real life bad guy who comic book fans consider to be worse than the Joker, Lex Luthor, and Magneto combined? Welcome to Footnoting History. I'm Mariah, and today we're going to take a look at Dr. Frederick Wortham, the anti-comic supervillain who is credited for bringing down the golden age of comics. Probably no figure in the history of comics is as vilified as Dr. Frederick Wortham. In the early 1950s, he was one of the most vocal opponents of the comic book industry, and he was really important to the anti-comics crusade because he gave the movement scientific validity. Because before Wortham, the movement was mostly comprised of parents, teachers, police organizations, some religious leaders. But with the publication of The Seduction of the Innocent, Wortham's most famous book, suddenly the movement was about more than comics being immoral or not educational. Now they were medically bad for you, too. But who was Dr. Wortham? And what was his beef with comic books? Well, Dr. Frederick Wortham was born Frederick Wertheimer. He was a German Jew raised in the early 19th century in both Germany and England. Originally, Wortham wanted to be a medical doctor, and he was studying medicine at King's College in London when World War I broke out. After the war and a brief internment in a British concentration camp, he went back to Germany to finish his medical degree. It was during this time that Wortham became interested in psychiatry. So after his graduation, he tried a few internships in Vienna, London, Paris, but he never quite felt like he had found his mentor. That is, until he landed a position as an assistant to a man named Emil Kreplin. Now, when it came to the brain, Kreplin was the guy. He was, in fact, the founder of modern psychiatry. Not psychology, that was Freud. But when it came to the physical, medical study of the brain, this guy wrote the book. Literally. His Encyclopedia of Psychology was the first work to argue that psychiatry was a totally valid field of medicine, and also claimed that psychiatric disorders likely had a physical basis, like any other illness. Because of his pretty radical ideas, Kreplin was also a social activist. He campaigned against the horrendous treatment going on in insane asylums. He also advocated actually treating mentally ill criminals instead of just throwing them in jail or executing them. By the time that Wortham apprenticed with Kreplin, Kreplin also had started to believe that there were cultural and social explanations for mental disease. He began to theorize that it was the context of an individual's life, things like culture, environment, and social and economic realities, which were crucial. And unlike the Freudians, whose idea of treatment was to change the individual to better fit society, think of the term well-adjusted, Kreplin thought it was a better idea to change society to produce healthier individuals. So when Wortham left his apprenticeship with Kreplin for a job at John Hopkins University in the United States, he was pretty convinced that it was society that made a person sick. And what he saw when he got to the U.S. would only solidify that opinion. You see, John Hopkins is in Maryland, and this was 1922. So what Wortham stepped into was a world of segregation, the American Jim Crow South. For a person very sensitive to the human psyche, segregation is a horrifying thing to witness. Wortham pretty immediately began to cause trouble at his new job. He was one of the only psychiatrists who was willing to see and treat black patients, and he also began to testify on behalf of poor black defendants. So picture this a foreign Jewish guy telling all white jurors in the Jim Crow South that it was basically their own fault if blacks were committing crimes. You can just imagine how well this played out. Even though Worthen's behavior did not earn him too many friends locally, there were people who noticed. People like the famous defense attorney Clarence Darrow, who Worthen became friends with. But all this testifying helped land Wortham a position in New York City as the head of the Court of General Sessions Psychiatric Clinic. This job was basically to give psychiatric examinations to every convicted felon in New York City to decide whether they would benefit from psychiatric treatment. This new job put Wortham at the forefront of a brand new field of medicine, forensic psychology. Wortham soon became one of America's leading forensic psychiatrists, and an expert on both criminal behavior and what made people commit crimes in the first place. And some of his ideas were pretty radical. 
For starters, he believed that the human brain was the same no matter what race you were, an idea called universalism. And he also believed that what made African Americans psychologically different than whites was because they were treated like second-class citizens, not because of anything genetic or innate. Based on these radical ideas, Wortham started to agitate for the creation of a free psychiatric center in Harlem. He eventually got together with two African American activists, Richard Wright and Earl Brown, and together they founded the Lafargue Mental Hygiene Clinic. It was the first clinic in the country that offered psychiatric help regardless of either race or ability to pay. And this was huge at a time when most psychiatrists refused to help black patients because they just felt that the black brain was too different to benefit from standard, read white, psychiatric techniques. The clinic also ended up being one of the only places where young black psychiatric professionals could get clinical experience, and where the staff was an interracial mix of men and women. At this point, Wortham is being called a champion of the downtrodden, and that's the title his critics gave him. So it's not surprising that he would turn his attention to children, especially delinquent children. Now, Wortham was no rube. At this point, the guy had worked with the worst of the worst. People like Albert Fish, a notorious pedophile who killed and cannibalized children. Or the Lonely Hearts case, in which a boyfriend-girlfriend team brutally murdered a widow and her baby in order to steal the dead woman's home. So Wortham wasn't just some suit with a theory. He was a hardcore forensic psychiatrist who had interviewed thousands of criminals. Wortham also knew that comic books were not the fundamental problem. In fact, on numerous occasions, Wortham stated clearly that, quote, juvenile delinquency has only one cause, adults. But remember who Wortham's mentor was, Emil Kreplin, the guy who argued that you should fix society to create better individuals. Well, right in line with this idea was a second idea, that you should go after the branches of a problem as well as the roots. Bad parents and sick adults might be the primary cause of juvenile delinquency, but if comic books were part of the problem, then they need to be taken care of as well. Why did Wortham focus on comic books? Well, there were two reasons. First, most of the kids who came to his clinic read comic books. In an era where there was only one family television, comics were the only kids-only entertainment that parents had little control over therefore making them extremely popular among all kinds of children. Second, because comic books were pretty odious. Now, there are a lot of people who will take issue with that statement, and there are hundreds, if not thousands, of websites and forums where comic book fans will wax nostalgic over the genre's golden age. But the reality is that the most popular and problematic comic books in the 1950s weren't Superman or Captain America. Instead, it was the crime and horror comic genre, which publishers were racing to produce. Cheap, poorly written comics, which competed to be the grossest, goriest, and most reprehensible. As if that wasn't bad enough, these new comics really emphasized a lot of the baser aspects of American society, especially its misogyny and racism. Wortham pointed out the uncomfortable truth that comic book heroes were always these white Nordic supermen, while the villains were always non-whites, Jews, Italians, Asians, Blacks, Latinos, etc. Africans in particular were often portrayed as only semi-human, and it was acceptable to draw black women with their breasts fully exposed, while white women's breasts had to be at least marginally covered. And in experiments he conducted at his clinic, Wortham found that children picked up on these distinctions pretty readily. When shown a new comic, they could quickly identify the good guys and bad guys based solely on the character's race and appearance. But as bad as the racist imagery was, Wortham was even more upset by the way in which comic books portrayed women. Many comics routinely normalized scenes of domestic violence. Nearly every comic had a couple of pages dedicated to scantily clad women, bound by ropes or chains, often being brutally beaten or tortured. Now, Wortham was no prude, even if his critics called him that. In 1948, just a couple of years before he published Seduction of the Innocent, Wortham testified on behalf of a nudist magazine that their contents were in no way obscene. In fact, Wortham compared the magazine's more realistic portrayal of women favorably to the way comic books denigrated women. In his own words, Wortham told the Obscenity Committee, quote, I personally would much rather have a young boy and say, look at this, 
This is how it is. Instead of reading at night these pictures where girls are just in the poses of being tortured, torn apart, and it is only made good because at the last moment the hero comes and saves them. But before that, there is all the excitement of reducing a girl to some kind of a tortured slave or somebody who has to give in for some reason or another. And that was the crux of Worthen's issue with comic books, that they reinforced the worst of American society and not the best of it, that they normalized racism and sexism, and that they gave messed up kids, already prone to criminality, blueprints for crimes that were even worse than they would have come up with on their own. Today, critics of Worthen portray him as an elitist, a nasty old fuddy-duddy who wanted to take away kids' entertainment for the sake of getting media attention and advancing his own career. But the evidence suggests that Wortham was a man ahead of his time. He testified in federal courts against censorship and was the first psychiatrist to do so. He was a man who fought for the underdog and cared deeply about creating a better society. Even some of his worst critics were privately won over by his good sense of humor and deep sense of compassion. For example, horror comics publisher Alan Hewitson, who famously claimed that the only use for Wortham's books was to, quote, prop up his desk, would be inspired to write to Wortham after meeting him for the first time. Every belief I had about a man I loathed and hated for practically 15 years was debunked. You were simply not the maniac and extremist I thought you were. Instead, I found a wise humanist, a literate artist, and a complete gentleman. So I'm perverted after meeting Satan. I'm led into the garden of second thought. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. See you next week!